Rockefeller's empire, Standard Oil, grew into the world's most powerful monopoly by ruthlessly eliminating competitors, seizing control of various industries, bribing government officials, and approaching business like a battlefield. In Jay-Z, Hove, Sean Corey Carter, amassed 14 solo albums, all certified platinum, 24 Grammy Awards, making him one of the most decorated artists in Grammy history. Inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 2017. Co-founded Rockefeller Records in 1995. Launched Rockaware Clothing in 1999. Acquired Tittle in 2015. Achieved billionaire status with his wife in 2019. This is a story about going from poverty and desperation. There would be no rapping Jay-Z if it wasn't for me. 100. To opulence and ruthless, hostile takeovers. Yeah, the takeover, the break's over, nigga. God MC, Who's next? me, Jehovah. Y'all don't see the lineup? Jay-Z is setting Diddy up. Yeah. It's the rock. It's your boy. Today we will learn how the first black John D. Rockefeller was created. Hey y'all, hey. So this one is gonna be a rather long one. Uh, so just go ahead and sit your tail on down and get ready and get to the end of the video because you're going to either be affirmed in some things that you heard or you are going to learn some new things but this is a really interesting rabbit hole and web and it goes directly from light to dark well i mean like maybe gray to black <laughs> so with that being said uh absolutely smash that subscribe button like comment and share and we're going to go ahead and jump right into it Projects in Brooklyn, places like this, you have like uh, a sense of feeling of worthlessness, you know? My days growing up, I was really confused. I didn't have no direction. I'm from where the hammers rung, news cameras never come. People would get shot, and people would get killed, and we never be in the paper or on the news or anything. So, like, we was like, our life ain't even worth a point. So nobody, no one cares whether you live or die. And that's where that mentality grows at. I'm gonna get it or I'm gonna die trying. If I he was not exaggerating. Surviving in the environment he grew up in was absolutely a matter of life or death. Sean Corey Carter, born December 4th, 1969, to Gloria Carter and Adnis Reeves. He was raised during the crack epidemic of the 1980s. And when he was six years old, he moved to Marcy Projects, where eventually he would come to meet longtime friends, Memphis Bleak, Tata Smith and Sauce Money. He started selling drugs at the age of 13, nearly two years after his father left and abandoned him. Like many of his peers, he looked up to the local drug dealers as role models. So what we're gathering here is someone who had to, at his core, to survive, be cold, be brutal, be calculating, and he had to deal with an abandonment wound. These are the makings of the psychological profiling of Sean Corey Carter. And yes, of course, we have to give credence to the fact that that is not all of who he is we could never really fully know all of who someone is however when something stands out and it's not natural 
and you have to adapt to it. You develop a certain toolkit that is far more obscure than those who have not had that very unique experience. So that is what we are highlighting today. Uh, the song Moment of Clarity, you talk about, I wasn't sure when I heard it, but it felt like you're talking about your brother. No, I'm talking about my pop. That's your how pops, I started. Pop, pop died, I didn't cry. Died. Okay. Like, when my pops died, um, you know, I didn't cry. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, that's how it starts. Pop died, didn't cry, didn't know him that well. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But it just came from me um, being real about those feelings. Like, when I was watching, when I went to the church and I seen him, mm -hmm. like, my first thought was I was, it was a smirk. Like, I was smiling a little bit like, yo, this guy looks so much like me. Hold up there now, Jay-Z. This story of you not feeling for your father at his passing sounds eerily similar to a pure rapper of yours. One that you bit from quite a bit over your career history. Allegedly, supposedly. Oops. Oopsie. So you mean to tell me you had the same exact reaction as Tupac? Hmm. Um, you know, I didn't cry. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, that's how it starts. Pop died, didn't cry, didn't know him that well. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But what you will find throughout the entirety of this documentary is that there are little nuances that show you that the industry had a really severe obsession with Tupac and Aaliyah consequently. I don't know what that was all about, but they were on Tupac and Aaliyah's top baby. Y'all let me know what y'all think in the comments about that whole hot mess. Now remember, this video is all about Jay-Z being the Black John D. Rockefeller. So in order for us to qualify that statement and begin to build upon that theory, we have to look at John D.'s early life. The first billionaire in history, the man who took over the American economy. He monopolized oil and had the U.S. market on his hands. They say he's the richest man to have ever lived. His wealth was about $400 billion. John D. Rockefeller, also known as the Oil Baron of Cleveland. The Rockefellers were a German family who had six children. The second son was named John, who was born in the year 1839 in New York. Their father was, often moving from one city to another, cause of financial situation was very tight. John would do any job he could find to meet the needs of his mother. At some point, their father disappears. After that, let's do a hard stop at eventually his father disappears and talk about this motherfucker they called Devil Bill. That's how rotten he was. They nicknamed him Devil Bill. He was a traveling snake oil salesman. So in modern terms, that would be considered to be a scammer. Um, he was once an athlete, a ventriloquist a panty raider, a rolling stone. He also was an animal trainer. At one point, he brought a bear home and trained it to do tricks. So I guess even back then, men chose the bear too, huh? But no, seriously, uh, this guy was something else okay now the Rockefellers often had to move to duck Bill's legal troubles and sexual assault allegations now Devil Bill even changed his legal name at one point to pretend to be a doctor to duck the police John's father would be gone for weeks or even months and would return with lavish gifts now John would side eye his pops because he's like while you out there scamming people and getting your freak on as a single married man the family was living in a dilapidated house they wore ragged clothing and they endured hunger and cold every night i mean they were really suffering so when you think about john's upbringing it is very equivocal 
to living in the projects. And I know that a lot of people who are black American are not used to hearing these impoverished stories about Europeans, but this actually was a situation where he lived in squalor and he had a, a, a dad that abandoned him. Very, very similar to Jay-Z's situation. So keep in mind that this is the mind and the behaviors that actually raised Rockefeller. Raised the man who became the richest man in America. The guy obviously had mental issues, um, depravity. He was a pure degenerate at heart. So this man was raised by a degenerate and he had to pick up the slack when his dad was not handling business as a husband. So literally, John D. Rockefeller became a husband's son. A child should not be burdened by the relationship problems of an adult. It is not a child's responsibility to uplift you as a mother. It is not a child's responsibility to be your strength as a mother. If you come into a man's life and you feel like you got to compete with his mother for his attention, his time, his priority, that is not a relationship for you. Some men are still emotionally dependent on their mothers and those mama's boys ain't ready to be husbands. Hey Jim, what would lead a mother to treat their son like a romantic partner? This is what we think of as mother, son, and enmeshment and there can be lots of reasons. One could be that the mother herself is very emotionally immature or maybe a narcissist. She could be living in a lonely and loveless marriage. Needs are not being met. Project those onto her son. Maybe beginning to burden him with duties, responsibilities, or make him a surrogate partner, confiding in him overly. When the woman is codependent and her emotional hunger is then projected onto her son. She might be overprotective of him when he's young and then later starts to burden him with adult things he shouldn't be concerned with and then fosters incompetence in him at, at some times as well. The man themselves is often burdened with guilt and because he's trauma bonded with his mother has a really hard time setting any kind of limits with her. So in John D. Rockefeller's case, his mother being the traditional wife, her and her children suffered in silence and in poverty in a time where women couldn't even get bank accounts. So there was nothing she could do to improve the quality of her family's life. And her husband literally just disappeared because he was out there hoe hopping. So she had no choice but to lean on her son but this can create a very, very toxic environment. On the other hand, Jay-Z, whose father also left when he was a teenager, his mother is black. <laughs> and I hate to be stereotypical, but she was having none of that. Going out in the middle of the night, and he's looking for the, you know, the guy who killed his little brother. Mm -hmm. Right, but he has a family. Mm -hmm. So my mom is looking at him like, what you want? Mm -hmm. She don't have the language or the tools to tell him, man, we love you. We don't want nothing to happen to you. We need you, mm -hmm. right? So how it comes out to her is, where the hell you going? Mm -hmm. You got kids here. Mm -hmm. And how it sounds to him is, you want me to choose between you and my yeah. baby brother, you don't, you don't give who I was supposed brother. to protect, mm -hmm. right? Now there's the fracture, <laughs> right? So among other things, you know, they, they, it's relationship and that's their relationship, not ours. Now I was his children. Definitely had the right mindset as he became older and wiser. He talks about this a lot in various different interviews, how his whole mindset was like, you know, dad, screw you, you ain't shit, you left us. And as he becomes older, he became more aware. Side note, look at Kevin Hart's face. I cannot take him seriously now there are conspiracy that outside of beyonce kids there are other kids who have just definitely not been claimed but that is speculation so i digress the important thing that jay-z talked about when he was sitting down with kevin hart is that 
his parents had a fractured relationship and it was not for him to step in and attempt to heal or cure that fracture however it took him until his late 40s to actually truly embody and realize that or at least the album preceding 444 he also goes on to say therapy is really what moved him forward and how they were taught everything except for emotional intelligence so that was pretty prolific however that hindsight is always 2020 so the same can be said i believe about john d rockefeller he stepped into the role that his father abandoned and that's because the opportunity was vacant and the solution for that role was needed okay and what we're seeing is is there is a uncanny parallel to being both abandoned by their father being left in poverty and squalor what that did to them psychologically and how that created this feeling of low worthiness which we will see that this hole inside only becomes quenchable with more acquisition of external and material wealth Kevin Lyles, Leo, all of them, every single label, they all said no. And he becomes one of the greatest rappers alive. So my PST is I'm never going to shop anyone or listen to anyone again. Those are the same people that are up under this that said that he was too old, rap too fast, and dress corny. From Kev Lyles to Warner to Def Jam, we had to do it ourselves. For me, I learned don't listen to nobody. Because if I would have listened to them, there would be no Jay-Z because he wasn't going to do it. There would be no rapping Jay-Z if it wasn't for me 100,000% because he wasn't going to do what I did to make sure he got hurt. He was hustling. And yeah. he wasn't going to put a record out by himself and create a record company. He could rap, but he didn't know business. I taught him business. How to put a record out yourself. How to leverage a celebrity. Put it on a product yourself. Who taught you? God. Harlem taught me. Besides tooting his own horn, Dame made some really important revelations that I think will help us to understand the persona of the rapper Jay-Z that he had to become. First, none of the labels wanted Jay-Z. They said he was too old and he dressed corny. Could it be that that rejection and, ban and abandonment wound was being triggered again? Is that possible? The same rejection and abandonment wound that he felt from his own father? Just a thought. Number two, the fact that Jay-Z was a hustler, a dope dealer. He was not even really trying to be famous, which he admits early on in his career and to happen is that i always say it's like that that night when jordan was playing portland and they were playing in the playoffs and he just shooting threes he, i think he had like nine threes or something that night and he's shrugging his shoulders like they was like what's happening he was like he, it was just he was just feeling it, it was just he just got that groove because i think you also mentioned that maybe with the last album you felt too much pressure to be it wasn't even the, it wasn't the pressure of being you know what i mean Jay-Z, it was just so many different things that was going on during the time, you know what I mean, as far as, you know, the label and, I mean, it, just, it was just a whole bunch of different things that was happening, and it was just, I never really wanted to be, like, just making albums every year, you know what I mean, that wasn't my intent, my intent was to come in here so we can have some place, you know, for myself and my peoples, you know what I mean, so we can work and we can enterprise in a legit manner, you know what I mean. Is it me or does that sound real money laundering like? Sounds like he wanted to turn some illegitimate money into some legit money to me. But uh, I ain't the one to gossip. So you ain't heard that from me. No, you haven't. Now, Jay-Z definitely states more than once that he had no intentions on being famous. 
In fact, he mentions this in his song, Lost One, with Chrisette Michelle, where he says, I heard motherfuckers saying they made hove. Okay, so make another hove. Niggas wasn't playing they day role, so we parted ways like Ben and J-Lo. <laughs> I should have been did it, but I've been in the days, though. I put friends over business end of the day, though. But when friends business interests as day glow, ain't nothing left to say, though. I guess we forgot what we came for. See? I should have stayed in food and beverage, too much floss and too much Sam Robinson. I ain't a bitch, but I gotta divorce him. Hove had to get the shallow shit up off him. And I ain't even want to be famous. Niggas is brainless. Too, too unnecessarily go through these changes. Damn. And I don't even know how it came to this. Except that the fame is the worst drug known to man. Now he says something key when he said ninjas is brainless to want to go through all these changes. What changes you might ask? Well, interestingly enough, most deaf Yasin Bey has an answer it's to that. Cocaine is running this rap shit. Show yak and e pills is running this rap shit. The wave over, turn your face over, nigga. No guard in the sky, it's me. Game over. Hey, little soldiers, you ready for war? But don't ask what you fighting for. Just hope that you survive the gunfight, the drama, the stress. You get in the line of fire, we get the big ass checks. You get in your choice of him. Make your choice and fall in. This is whole stroke, B.I. Take that cock in your B.I. B.I. So let's draw some connections. The very premise of Jay-Z being an intentional dealer, but an unintentional celebrity, may be the core foundation of what makes him such a shrewd and calculating businessman, which we will come to see later on. Now, what I see and what I propose is a transfer of degeneracy, if you will. In many ways, the record business is a lot like being a dope dealer. <laughs> you know, you're front at the product, which is your marketing budget and your tour budget and your recording budget, etc. Meaning you're given an advance by the record company and you have to sell records to do so and recoup the money back and give it back to the record company and then in a perfect scenario you get back all the profits and you take what and you take out whatever competitor stands in your way so ultimately we're looking at a transference of the same type of principle as selling weight on the streets Instead, he's just selling records. He never had a chance to heal from whatever abandonment and rejection wound he had from his father. He was still ruthless and shrewd from the streets. And he simply just transferred the same mentality over into the music. Now, there's a couple of people you can't avoid not talking about when you talk about the making of Jay-Z. You gotta talk about Biggie. You gotta talk about Nas. You gotta talk about Big L. You gotta talk about Jazzo. But for the purpose of this video, we're just gonna focus on Nas and Biggie. So in 1994, Nas came out with the song, The World Is Yours. Instant smash, the streets love it. Nas became a darling in the rap industry thereafter. He coined the phrase, I'm out for dead presidents to represent me. This is important to Jay-Z's initial offering in his career as a rapper. In 1995, that is when Rockefeller Records were founded, right? And this is when he dropped the song in 1996 called Dead Presidents. Basically taking that line from Nas. Where, and remember in Takeover he said, you made it a hot line. I made it a hot song. So you also have to consider the connection with Tupac as well. Now, I got to be honest with you. The streets and rap was kind of like across the street. They was kissing cousins. So you weren't going to avoid the streets, especially early on in rap's diaspora. So in 1994, Tupac Shakur got shot at 
Quad Studio. Despite five bullet wounds, the iconic rapper is on his way to court to hear the verdict in his sexual assault case. A series of events that would change his life and in turn rap history forever. The night he was shot in the lobby of Quad Studios on November 30th, 1994. A hot spot for rap artists at the time. That's Sean Diddy Combs outside as police arrived on scene. He was shot numerous times, at least twice in the head. Tupac was able to make the accusation that Biggie did this by feeling like he was being subbed and trolled in and and taunted in his 1995 release of his song who shot you but Pac wasn't having it he straight went off on everybody in New York from from notorious big to Puffy, to Jay-Z, everybody. And it ignited this big East Coast, West Coast beef that we all know about. But Biggie swore up and down that he released that song way before Pop got shot and he had nothing to do with Pop being shot. <laughs> Hold up, say that again, Biggie. <laughs> Dead Presidents, the video was shot in February of 1996 and Tupac sadly met his untimely demise in September of 1996. So my question is, if you didn't do it, Biggie, why are you subbing and taunting the man? And look at the rest of them over there sitting at the table laughing like a bunch of hyenas. That is at least mildly suspect. Street warfare abounds and unfortunately Biggie is led to his untimely demise in March of 1997, leaving a big hole in the ethos for the crown king of New York. And the only one that could truly step up to the plate at the time would be Mr. Nasir Jones, Nas. Unfortunately, Jay-Z had other plans. Jay-Z waged war with Nas under the guise of nah, 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 I got more commercial success than you. Very similar to the sentiments of another rap beef. Though obviously Takeover was a very decent song, it totally <laughs> crushed the soul of Mob Deep and many other notable small time rappers and it could it definitely showcased that Jay-Z was coming for the crown. However, he was out lyrically manned by Nas. Once again, very similar to another rap beef that we just seen recently. And that it showcased that the streets still had the heart of hip hop. It was still very much so connected to lyricisms. In an attempt to go nuclear, the rapper Jay-Z went a little too far and started talking about sleeping with other people's girls. And it just went too far, once again, very similar to another rap beef until his mommy got involved. Once again, very similar to another rap beef. Oh my God, the parallels. And it, he had to call it quits. So we can summarize the making of Jay-Z best with this. Sean Carter is worse. Uh oh, oh man. He's smarter, he's patient. He's not sloppy. He lined up D Haven, stole his life and identity. He lined up Big L, stole his life and identity. He lined up Dame Dash, stole his life, identity, and took his love. Lined up R. Kelly. Yes, sir. Young. So 
So, so far, we've been able to draw pretty significant parallels between John D. Rockefeller and Sean Carter, and it's still the same. We understand the pain, but that pain unchecked festered and turned into something much more sinister. And it would be unfortunately the same for John D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller's empire, Standard Oil, grew into the world's most powerful monopoly by ruthlessly eliminating competitors, seizing control of various industries, bribing government officials, and approaching business like a battlefield. In the shadows of his empire, Rockefeller's influence extended beyond mere business. Bribing officials became a strategic tool, ensuring that laws and regulations bent in his favor. The legacy of Standard Oil is a complex one. On one hand, it revolutionized the oil industry and contributed to the growth of the American economy. On the other, its monopolistic practices led to significant legal and ethical questions, ultimately resulting in its breakup. The impact of Rockefeller's empire is still felt today, a testament to both his ingenuity and the controversies he sparked. So many started building up their own oil refinery business in the hope of making money. Rockefeller wasn't too happy about this. He wanted to dominate the entire industry. So he went like a shark throughout the country, buying up any oil refineries that he could get his hands on. He moved so fast that within two years, the majority of Cleveland's refineries belonged to Standard Oil, his company. But some competitors refused his offers and kept up their business. Now Rockefeller resorted to other tactics to get them to sell. He would buy up all the oil barrels to cause a shortage that crippled the smaller companies. He would keep the prices of his products so low that even he would make a loss. This way all customers would come to buy his products and not the competitors. Eventually the competition just did not have the finances to keep up with Rockefeller's standard oil. They gave in and got bought out by his now growing empire. Now a lot of people during this time, they did not agree with the way Rockefeller was buying out all of these businesses. He, he saw it in a different way. He thought by buying out these weaker underperforming refineries, he was doing them a favor because they did not have the right processes to compete. This way the whole of America would benefit because he would improve their processes, waste less money and therefore give consumers a cheaper product drawing the parallels we can see that their rise to dominance and prominence end up hurting a lot of people something that they saw as a necessary casualty from an end to a means funny how jay-z named his company rockefeller records when he is so much completely alike john d rockefeller maybe that's something that he already knew so in 1911, the Supreme Court ordered the breakup of Standard Oil. After finding that the company was in violation of what they called the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, the company was then dissolved and split into 34 independent companies. This court order in turn provided us with the high ass gas stations that we know today like bp chevron exxon mobile marathon uh etc with that being said yes they did some fucked up things and they hurt a lot of people but that by far does not take the cake you guys i want to share with you the secret covenant that you might or might not have heard about the Secret Covenant was created by none other than the Rockefellers and maybe even someone even higher than them, let's be honest. But this is their secret covenant and their clause of things that they wanted to follow. And when, if you're a conspiracy theorist or a critical thinker and you're aware of what's been going on in the world, you're gonna know exactly how suitable this is. This is written word for word and I wanna read it to you. Okay, so bear with me. The Secret Covenant, an illusion it will be so large, so vast it will escape their perception. Those who will see it will be thought of as insane. We'll create separate fronts to prevent them from seeing the connection between us.
At this point, I know exactly what many of you are thinking. Conspiracy theory, here we go. But what I want to point out is some notable information that could potentially potentially make you think a little bit more critically about this so i did a little research and i was wondering like why was sean carter throwing up these signs now let's put a couple things together mm, he was a dealer who just happened to be a good rapper who had not had an opportunity to even truly transition out of his street mentality before he was rushed into a lavish life with an excess of money that could be got legally with a actual structure that was very similar to gang life in the streets huh and he's throwing up this sign that has absolutely nothing to do with the Rockefeller Records logo. I looked high and low for more information on what's going on with the Rockefeller logo. You know, why are they throwing up the quote unquote diamond? And so I read an article where, where he said, you know, back in the day, he used to rap with his old neighborhood friends and they used to do shows and they just knew that one day they were going to be wealthy. So they would throw up the diamond signs. The problem is a diamond is in the exact opposite direction. The thing that is most closely related to the symbolism that they are throwing up is a pyramid and many times he put his eye between that said pyramid let's think about this for a second if you're throwing up a diamond why the fuck are you putting your eye between that diamond that doesn't make sense it's basically sus as hell so you got this weird sus elitist energy about controlling the minds of the people and population and creating illusions and deceitfulness and this all seems to be some committed coordinated act something that both it appears john d rockefeller as well as jay-z engaged in and it appears that they created so many enemies and stepped on so many people's heads along the way before i land my plane i just want to showcase some of the allegations of what allegations of people who jay-z has been said to step on and i believe that these people that he stepped on especially with regard to his business partner is what made him hove it's a secret society all we get is trust but it's a secret society all we get is trust In a gang, you don't win because you are the most talented or the best. You win because you are willing to take out your opponent by any means necessary or you are willing to acquire your opposition. I made the comparison of how the record industry is structured very similar to the way that um, dope deals are structured. So it's only right to give them the same credence as a gang. So in this particular section, we are going to look at the alleged acquisition, hostile takeover, and elimination done by the God MC Hove and alleging what helped him rise to his high level of success. Of course, this is mostly speculation, third and fourth hand account, so take it with a grain of salt. Rihanna. 
when Rihanna herself recalled how Jay would lock her up in his office until 3 a.m. But as usual, Jay-Z used his power and influence to make this whole story disappear before it could get any bigger. The publicist who spilled the tea about the affair mysteriously came up and backtracked everything he said. He said he made it all up in a desperate attempt to promote Rihanna's new single, Ponda Replay. So nervous. I was so I was shaking literally. But the moment I walked into the office, the atmosphere was so warm and welcoming. You had to sing a cappella for him? Yes, I had to sing. I sang Fun Replay. I sang another ballad from the album uh -huh. last time. Yeah. So then what did he say to you? He said something to you. Oh, yes. He said, we don't sing songs here. We sing artists. And there was this little pause. And I was nervous. But then he said, and we're interested. And there was this sudden feel of relief. But then he said something about excitement. a window and a door. Oh, then he said... <laughs> You did a whole lot. I did a lot of work on you in this place. He said, um, there are two ways to leave here. Either through the door with the deal sign or through this window, and we're on the 29th floor. Jaguar Wright explained how Rihanna was sold to Jay-Z at 16 years old. She explained how it was super sketchy that Rihanna got brought to America at only 16 years old without any parental supervision and how she auditioned for Jay-Z at 3 o'clock in the morning. She explained how it didn't make sense that Rihanna's parents would let her fly by herself after just meeting Evan Roberts all the way to America to meet with Jay-Z in the middle of the night. And she alleged that Rihanna's dad got a half a million dollar payout for letting this happen. She alleged since this was all out of the blue, Rihanna would have had to flown on a private plane to get from Barbados to America because she wouldn't have had a visa and her parents were not around with her to fly to America. And Rihanna even explained how Jay-Z would not let her leave until she signed the recording contract and the label locked her in the office until 3 a.m. You've gone through some big... Tierra Marie. Early large record producer started making some calls about a singer he had working out of his studio. By the time all of the ink was dry, she was just shy of being legal, but that didn't stop the mogul. He liked to sample the new talent. He was sampling her on a fairly regular basis, but he was also involved with the current A-plus list singer who was in his face every day. And this could allegedly be Beyonce. Amid allegations surrounding Diddy, Jay-Z's silence is now explained by Jaguar Wright, who claims Jay-Z is even more problematic. A disturbing rumor suggests Jay-Z allegedly had relations with an underage singer from his label, leading to her career downfall when Beyonce discovered it. I'm no longer on the label because, well, to be honest with you, I don't know why I'm no longer on the label, but um, I know that I just took some time off to finish school or whatnot, and then, you know, in the midst of that, I was in Detroit, and um, I just got a phone call, like, I think I was getting ready for prom or something, and they were like, you know, we, we're gonna be letting you go, you're young, you have a bright future ahead of you, you know, the womp womp talk. And and as the story goes, because Beyonce found out about the affair, she was promptly blackballed from the industry. Rihanna was then boosted, even though she was also accused of having an affair with Jay-Z or an inappropriate relationship with him. Aaliyah. Y'all, this one really saddens me to think that anyone did anything to cause Aaliyah and her family pain as she was a true gem to us all brings me great sadness. Within the context of time, since these people are inextricably connected to one another, that being Aaliyah, Dame Dash, R. Kelly, all connected i won't be covering the underage allegations for foxy brown and beyonce as well as the cheating scandal and the solange him getting his head knocked between the washer and the dryer on the elevator i won't be covering that today but i will definitely land my plane with a video montage of these three people and i hope that you have enjoyed Stole his life and identity. He lined up Big L. Stole his life and identity. He lined up Dame Dash. Stole his life, identity, and took his love. They were both actively trying to win her attention. Yes, and the thing about Aaliyah was like, every time I saw her, she looked different. So she had different looks every time. And I was like, who is that? And I realized it was Aaliyah. And then I just threw my A game. And then, you know, I guess Jay was trying to get at her as well. Even when they both knew that the other was trying to get at her. Yeah, two friends going crazy over the same girl is the situation that never ends well. Allegedly, Sean Carter is responsible 
for enacting Hype Williams to put a Leo on a faulty plane to move her out the way as punishment for rejecting him. And so he could level up Beyonce, who was struggling. The most fucked up shit was Aaliyah dying. That was mm. the most fucked up shit. And all the shit I had to deal with with that. You'd be surprised how people act when they think you're hurt. That's when they really start trying to make moves on you. That time I was beefing in Def Jam and shit. It's uh, fucked up because y'all stay trying to do that. Y'all should have called Damon Dash and said, and you want the whole fucking thing to hear it? Keep the door open. I don't give a fuck. Y'all should have called Damon Dash, made sure I was privy to it, and made sure I was CC'd or whatever. You don't send an email randomly at 10.30 at night, whatever it is at night, the day we all had a wake. That shit don't fly right. That shit is fucked up. And on another level, it's not for y'all, because y'all do not control any of my hearts. That's why I'm asking questions. Everybody's looking dumb in the face. So what was we doing? What was we talking about in terms of the day? Let me know. Why don't we just call the meeting? Why? Because you know what it's like. Why? Damon, no one Why? Who cares? Why? We all here? Why now you want to call the meeting? Because you know, no one needs to sit here and be- No one, you're so get the fuck out. I don't give a no. fuck. Then get out. This is not about you. We're going to do no, something about Jay. We're going to do it together. Obviously. All right, then, but why you didn't call me? No, you want to make excuses? You can talk all you want. This is treacherous. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm sick of this shit. I'm- opinion or input on trying to make me the president, he starts shying away. Then from what Dave says, I don't you know, I said you have to ask Jay-Z, is that he got to a point where he didn't want to break bread with Biggs no more. So Dame says. Who didn't want to break bread? Jay-Z. Oh. Like they split, I don't know they split. I don't know if it's 50, 33, 30, 33. I don't know if Jay got 60, 20, 20. But this is Dame's story. This is what he's saying why everything's like, oh, he don't want to break Biggs off no more. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, this I don't know. After Oh Boy, this is you, this is yeah. not lit. Y'all got the cologne, oh yeah, boy, we would yeah. cologne. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But you can see Jay-Z starting to distance himself. He'll be around, but he'll be, you can see it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, if nigga come to the office five days a week. Me personally, I just think it, it was lack of communication. And Jay-Z wasn't, res not saying respect, but he wasn't digging how shit was being ran when he wasn't around. Sean Carter is worse. Uh oh, oh man. He's smarter. He's patient. He's not sloppy. Your opinion on the R. Kelly situation? Do you think he got railroaded or he he's there? He's where he belongs. Yeah, I think he's where he belongs. I mean, I, I you know I know Leah, so I know what he did. When Jay was doing videos with him, I was be in the video, but she I'd be like, yo, what do you want me to do? And she'd be like, don't start nothing, just don't be in no shots with him. So I would never you, you show me a picture of me in a picture with him and shit. Mm -hmm. And then when he when he did the record with a. a with him, with Jay, that's why I was kind of, that was almost like one of the things where I was just like, he's out of here, Jay, I just let it go. Cause I couldn't believe he did a project with her, with um, R. Kelly knowing that he had raped my girl. Sean Carter is worse. He's smarter. He's patient. You could ask me if I was running around celebrating. My mom was like, yeah, yeah. finally. And everybody hit me like, yo, you all right? You remember, nobody yeah, I was you running around, I was like, and I read it and I'm like, oh, I said, what that mean? You're like, that's what that mean right there. I'm like, oh, I can sell it now. And, and it means Cam McMakes can have it and Jay-Z can't do shit about it. Biggs can't do shit about it. No one can stop this sale. No one. <laughs> Ho! Cheer! I'm focused, man.